You're listening to the Higher Ideas Podcast, where ideas grow. Connect on Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, or higherideas.net. Now here's your host, I. Hello, fellow human, and welcome back to Higher Ideas. Today's episode marks the end of what I'm calling Season 1 of the Higher Ideas Podcast. Uh, no, it hasn't been a year, but the fact is, moving forward... The topics I want to talk about are going to be vastly different from what I've talked about so far. Uh, things are going to get deeper, more complex. Uh, things are going to start ruffling feathers. In season one, I've been pretty safe. It's been a pretty quaint season. It hasn't been too complex. It's been very surface level. And uh, I want to start going deeper. But as I said, season two is going to start ruffling feathers. It's going to go after some sacred cows. It's going to start pointing out elephants in rooms and dealing with complicated and uncomfortable concepts. So it's very important, I think, wrapping up Season 1 and leading into Season 2, to speak about ego. Because I guarantee you, every single person listening, as they continue listening to this podcast further, uh, at some point, will run into an egotistical reaction that makes you want to stop listening to the podcast, to judge me, to lose respect for me, etc. So it's important to start paying attention to ego. You will run into this problem. But before I get into that topic, which is a slippery fish to try and pin down, I do want to take a minute here just to tell you guys what an amazing person I am. <laughs> well, now that I've let that sink in, let me take a few guesses at thoughts that may have flown through people's heads as I just said that. Who does this guy think he is, right? What is he talking about? There's people much more amazing than this guy. This guy sucks. Oh man, I thought I respected this guy, but now I, I'm reconsidering. I might stop listening to this podcast. This guy's full of himself. Some of you may have rolled your eyes, but I'm pretty sure that everyone listening had some sort of reaction to that statement that came out of the blue. I am an amazing person. Now, some people might have thought, well, he's clearly demonstrating ego. Uh, this is obviously a bit of an act. He's trying to show us what ego looks like. Well, you're partly right. I am showing you what ego looks like, but not mine. I just showed you your own ego. And I'll explain in a second what was behind what I said. But first, I want to point out what an overreaction all of those assumptions would have been if you made any of them. I didn't say I was better than anybody, and I didn't say I'm the best at anything. And what's more, I didn't say you're not amazing. For all you know, maybe I think every single human being is amazing, and obviously I fall into that category by default, no better or worse than anyone else. You see, ego makes you overreact. It makes you jump to a negative conclusion and snap into an attack mode without you even realizing it happens so fast. A lot of you may have reacted before I even stopped speaking earlier and started thinking all of those things I said. But as I said, let me break down exactly what I was saying there so you can understand. When I said I'm an amazing person, I wasn't saying that in an egotistical way. See, the fact is, all my life I've been very self-conscious. Uh, I've had self-esteem issues, severe self-esteem issues. I've been down on myself plenty. Thank you very much. I don't really need anyone's help to take me down. Actually, what I've needed throughout my whole life is people to help me up. But by and large, people's egos try to cut anyone down. So I've had mostly the opposite. People keeping me down. People telling me to not get too full of myself, to stay in my place, and not say anything good about myself. But the fact is, throughout this life of living quietly, trying to be invisible and stay in corners, full of doubts and full of self-sabotage, I've met friends. I've met friends along the way. I've made acquaintances, I've had relationships. People from time to time have taken their time to get to know me, and I've opened up, and they have seen the real me inside behind all of that stuff. And every single one of them, pretty much, through my entire life, at some point have just taken a step back and said, 
my god, you are amazing. Do you not realize how amazing you are? And my answer would be no, I don't. I really don't think I'm amazing. I'm actually a piece of crap, and I just crap on myself. And no matter how much they tried to tell me, I would not accept it. And it's only in, let's say, the recent year that I've started to see what they've been talking about all along. Starting at Occupy, I saw a piece of that. And then I remembered all these people all my life who have said there's something amazing about me. And they haven't only said it, they've shown it through actions. People have attached themselves to me so strongly, and I've hurt people by accident, not even realizing that they were so attached. And, and it, it's, it's undeniable that people have thought, I am an amazing person. And so I've only started accepting this lately, not in a way that's full of myself, but in a way that's almost trying to honor all these people that have tried to extend me a hand and bring me up out of my misery all my life. And so out of respect, out of honor, and out of owning and accepting this thing that they've been trying to tell me all along, I thought it would be a good idea to pronounce it on the podcast. And that's where that was coming from. So that wasn't really coming from me. That was coming from the people that have been telling me this, trying to get this in my head. I was channeling their message and delivering it. So knowing that, now revisit what you may have thought when I said it, rolling your eyes at me, thinking, oh, this guy thinks he's better than me, thinking I'm going to stop listening to this guy. I don't respect this guy anymore. Who does this guy think he is? You're not better than me. All of that is so unnecessary. All of it was aggressive. All of it was destructive. And all of it was absolutely unwarranted and uncalled for. So where did that come from? It wasn't based on logic. It was a gut reaction. It hit you so fast. You did not have time to even consider what you were saying or any of those other possibilities. You jumped to the negative. Now what happened there was ego. Ego set that off in your mind and you ran with it. And there's nothing wrong with that. The fact is ego has been with you since you were a child. And it's very slippery, it's very insidious, it's very tricky. It works through your own mind and knows the ins and outs of all of your thoughts and weaknesses and fears. And it preys on that. And it, in the end, always ends up hurting you or someone else or both. In short, making the world a much more miserable place for everyone. And that's why I think one of the biggest issues I see in the world today, in every individual, and in every institution, in every government, in every war, in every big problem of the world, including pollution, it all boils down to ego. And that's why I can think of no better topic to dig into wrapping up the first season than this thing, ego, this damn thing that is wrecking everything. But allow me to convince you. Now, before I move forward, I think it's important to specify that there's two definitions of ego Maybe more, but there's two general definitions of the term. Now, Sigmund Freud coined the term. He invented the word ego. It was as a specific function of the human mind. The ego, in his definition, is very specific in what it does and why it's there, in his model of the human being's mind. So if you have a Freudian definition of ego in mind, a lot of what I'm going to say makes absolutely no sense. So I just want to say up front, that is not the definition I'm going with. Um, when I say ego, I mean it with the definition that's been adopted by Hinduism, Buddhism, and uh, other mindful living practices, uh, which is basically a term that covers the entire sense of self. When they use the word ego, it is your sense of identity. It is your wants and your desires and your needs and your dreams, your plans, your name, your family, your possessions, everything that is wrapped up around the idea of you is your ego. And in this model, you are a boundless mind. You are a free-floating consciousness that is rooted into an individual person. And the ego is there to help you manage your person to manage your video game character in this video game called life. It's sort of a middleman that watches what's going on in the outside and whispers advice into your ear. And it's been there, as I said, ever since you were a kid. And it works for you. This is the important thing to realize. It is not you. You aren't your ego. Your ego works for you. It performs a function for you. And you 
are not a slave to it. And you can tell it to sit its ass down when you don't want to listen to its advice. Now, since it works through your mind, as I said, it can be very tricky. It can have almost a sense of intelligence. When you start trying to defeat it, when you start trying to beat it back, it slips around your defenses and comes in from another side. It knows all of your weak points. So it's quite a huge battle to undertake. It's an epic, lifelong struggle to try and manage your ego. And as I said, it's always been there, so it's hard to see. It's kind of like your own heartbeat. That's always been there, and unless you really pay attention to it, it just keeps going and you don't really even feel it. You don't hear it. It's just there, and it's invisible. But you can learn to see it. If you pay attention and focus, you can listen to your heartbeat quite easily. It's the same with your ego. All it takes is attention. And that is the best way to think about ego as a bodily function. It's an autonomic organ. It's, it's not a physical organ. It's a process in your mind, but it acts just like an organ. It's reflexory, it's out of your control, and it will go on ticking whether you let it or don't. It's always going to be there. It's just like peeing, just like pooing, just like breathing, blinking, digesting, sexual urges, emotional urges, inner thoughts. All of these things happen on their own, whether you want them to or not. But when we learn to manage them as we grow up, we learn to let them out only when it's wise to. So you start going to the bathroom on the toilet instead of in your pants. You control your sexual urges as you grow up. You control your emotional outbursts when you're upset or when you're overjoyed or excited. You learn to keep it down. And your inner thoughts, you learn not to let those out in inappropriate situations. These are all things we learn as we grow up. But ego is such an invisible bodily function that we never learn to recognize it or even manage it. Ego awareness. It's just not part of our society. So the result is you end up acting like an ape quite often. You end up bashing people over the head who don't deserve it, and you soil your emotional pants, in other words. You can't control your functions. But I'm speaking very nebulously here. Let me get into an example that might help to dissect the actions of ego. Uh, let's say you're in a competition or some sort of contest. You've been working hard, you want to win at something or other, but you lose. Maybe you get second place. Now, people react differently in these situations based on how much control they have over their ego, but I think a lot of people out there would react in the following ways. Well, that judge is an idiot. That judge doesn't know what he's talking about. I think he's corrupt. I think he was paid off. I don't think he knows what he's saying. Obviously, I was the much better candidate for first place. I'm better. I should win. I should have won that. I know I won that. That judge is an idiot. So that's an attack, right? That's aggressive. That's making a whole lot of assumptions, again, based on nothing, really, just to make yourself feel better. But it's not to make yourself feel better. It's to make your ego feel better, because your ego is losing its mind when you, when you lose a competition. It starts rampaging around your mind, knocking over vases, breaking windows, screaming and ripping curtains, and you just want to calm it down because it's uncomfortable. And so you accept these logical things that get thrown at you. The judge is corrupt. I'm so much better. I should win. Yes, I should. That feels good. That calms my ego down. So I'll accept that and I'll go with it, no matter how illogical it is. Now, there's other things you can say, like, the winner didn't deserve it. I deserve it more than that guy. That guy has horrible technique for whatever the competition was. I worked so much harder. I trained so much longer. My craft is so much more honed than that winner. Obviously, this was a huge mistake. I should have won. You didn't. Now, another way to react is, who needs that damn award? Who needs to win that competition? I'm so much better than this competition. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to prove them all wrong. Well, once again, that's ego trying to hand you a little something to accept and to go with. Building yourself up, making you feel like you are the winner and everyone else is wrong. And now these are all obviously common egotistical reactions. Anyone hearing it would say, oh, buddy, calm down. You're, you're kind of making assumptions here. But there's another side to ego. Someone might react to losing a competition by saying I'm worthless I'm clearly not worth anything if I cannot win first place. First or nothing. Everything or I'm worthless. That's also ego. So it can cut both ways. It can cut outwardly or it can cut inwardly. 
but it cuts either way. It's damaging either way. And actually, that brings up an important point here, which is even judging is ego. Whether you judge yourself above someone, judge yourself below someone, that's all from ego, because that is you comparing yourself, your ego, to the self of someone else. So keep that in mind, whether you're a person who has high self-esteem or low self-esteem. It can go both ways, and it's equally as destructive. And that's why it's important to try and manage ego. So what would be the right reaction in this situation? If you lost a contest that is very important to you, how should you react? Well, it's simple. I lost. The flat, plain reality, I lost. Move on. Let go. Because see, ego wants to grip onto a situation and wants to hold on to it no matter how much it hurts and how damaging it is and it just wants to obsess on it. Just make me feel better about this. But the real answer to that situation is, hey, I lost. Better luck next time. I'll try harder. Turn it into a motivation. Without blaming anyone, yourself, anyone else, without clinging to the loss, just accept it, move on acceptance. It's a form of surrender. And it makes things a lot easier to deal with. It makes you a lot easier to deal with as a result. And there's a whole host of other situations where the same sort of reactionary forces happen. As I demonstrated earlier, when someone tries to speak highly of themselves, we react by trying to cut them down. Who does that really help? That doesn't help you, that might make you enemies. That doesn't help the other guy, that's just going to hinder him. So why do we feel so justified in doing it? Well, we feel justified because that's ego saying, yes, yes, serve me. And we do. We mostly do because we don't learn to recognize it. Here's another situation. Uh, have you ever been in the middle of an argument, a heated argument, and you realize that you're completely wrong and you've been beaten, but you keep having the argument? That's ego. I can't lose. I have to win, even though I now realize I'm completely wrong. I am going to keep going. And that's how many wars in the world keep going. That's ego. Not accepting being wrong when you know you're wrong. Here's some more examples. Uh, when you have a breakup, when people have a breakup and can't let it go, and it just cuts them for a year, they cannot stop obsessing about this situation, either getting upset by it or clinging on to it and not letting it go and not moving on or trying to find a way to hate the person or, or trying to find a way to cut that person or affect the person or trying to do things that will, that will upset that person. All sorts of things like that. Uh, people fly off the handle after a breakup. And it's not because of heartbreak. It's because of ego. Heartbreak would be just like losing a competition. I lost. It might take a while to get used to it, and it doesn't mean that you're worthless. It doesn't mean that the other person is worthless or horrible. It just means it's over. Move on. Let go. Ego is the thing that will try to cling on and keep you obsessed for so long. And meanwhile, you may be missing untold opportunities just walking by you as you're completely not paying attention to your surroundings. It's the same situation uh, in a workplace situation when you clamor for position, but not because you want it. You clamor for position to keep people below you from overshooting you, to keep people behind you. That's also ego. And who is that helping? If you help someone up and they end up overshooting you, and you help them. Well, they're in a higher position now to help you. That helps you. That helps that person. That helps you. But if you tried to stop that person from passing you like a jerk, and somehow they climbed their way past you, they'll always remember that you tried to hold them down. And they may try to hold you down when they get above you. So when you indulge ego, who are you really helping? You're not really helping anyone. 
it's very important to realize because it always comes with a sense of justification of no no i'm right i should be doing this or all sorts of logical confirmations that say it's good to do this but when you really analyze it objectively ego always hurts everyone when it is left out of control and financially it'll cost you money buying an expensive car obviously that's ego where you could have bought a car that just you know works getting the newest iPhone when your old iPhone still works just fine just to keep up just to stay ahead just to be on the cutting edge ahead of everyone else that's ego all the way and it costs you money getting expensive clothing or jewelry just to impress others again to place yourself above them that's ego it costs you money doesn't really make you that many friends basically everything that is a want and not a need comes from ego and i can say that with certainty because even things that come from need eating drinking sleeping these also serve the ego these are also managed by the ego so you can never really defeat it ego is important to survival because if you didn't have it you would basically be a baby a newborn baby a newborn child has no ego they don't even know that they're an individual they don't even know that they're a human being they just see the world around them and they are in the world and they are completely free they are completely unattached and they are completely happy look how happy a baby is and when they're sad they're sad they cry it passes they don't hold on to it they don't have an ego that holds a grudge about how mom rubbed my face too hard and made me cry and now i hate her no there's pain the baby cries the pain goes away the baby's happy again this is a great way to be. Of course, we can't dial it back that far and lose all sense of control on ourselves. But that is an example of the opposite extreme. We live at the other extreme of ego run amok which cripples and boxes you in. It's so destructive. I can't even explain adequately how destructive and out of control ego is. It's important to manage it. Ego closes you up. It's a defensive reflex. No matter how you slice it, you may feel that ego is an empowering thing, you may feel that ego is a weapon, but it closes you in. It's a defensive reaction. And as a result, it disconnects you from others. It closes doors around you. It shrinks your world. You have a smaller world the more ego you have. It makes you lonelier as a result. and it keeps others from loving the open real you inside no one will know the inner you if you drape yourself in ego so how do we defeat it well as i said you can't defeat it but you can tame it and that's important just the same way you had to tame your bodily functions you had to tame your sexual impulses you had to tame your raw emotional expression it's important to tame ego And how do you do that? Well, it's the same way you stop from peeing your pants. You just start paying attention to it. And a good way to spot it is unhealthy overattachment to an idea, to a person, to a habit, to a behavior, anything in life that you feel attached to in an unhealthy way where you just can't let it go and if anyone tries to pry you away from it, you freak out. That is ego. and that's ego freaking out inside you because ego's function is also to hold on to this world to try and grab on to something and hold on and find a foothold and just make sense of this whole thing that's another function of it but if it goes out of control it becomes unhealthy and here's another weapon i can give you against ego it's true name now they say in fairy tales that to know a thing's true name is to have power over it like the story of Rumpel Stiltskin. Well, the true name of ego is fear. Fear. When you logically dissect every egotistical act to its smallest element, that element is always the fear of death. And that is the core function of the ego. It's to keep you alive. is to make sure you don't let yourself be killed, let yourself be taken advantage of, let yourself be beaten. And as such it's a very powerful impulse. 
And if you finally manage it to a very high degree, you basically become virtually invincible. Nothing can threaten you. Nothing can scare you. It's a very powerful thing to have your ego under your control. But it's mindful work. Ego has tentacles wrapped around every single corner of your life. When you start trying to manage it, you'll find it everywhere and go, my God, how did ego get all over this place? I mean, why did I not see it before? You'll see this if you start paying attention. It's got roots entangling all of your internal machinery. It controls all of your decisions. It's been wreaking havoc that you haven't seen. And to trim it back is to become freer, is to become more comfortable in life. The benefits are astounding when you start managing ego. You forge deeper connections with people. You'll gain real power in the world, which is the power of respect, community, camaraderie. People will become willing to help you. They will not only be happy to help you, they will want to help you because you have projected such goodness out of yourself such selflessness, such goodwill, and they will know it. It's unmistakable when someone truly is a good person, and you will become a good person. You'll be far more open to love and camaraderie, friendships, as I said. You'll have a wider perspective on the world. It's very interesting because ego is a box. Since ego is a restrictive box, it also restricts your vision of a situation. It restricts what you allow yourself to think, what you allow yourself to feel. And so the more you unleash those holes, those bonds, you'll feel as if you can see further, you can see from higher up, you can be above a situation and sort of understand it better from many different perspectives. Because ego locks you into yourself, locks you into your own perspectives. It gives you a smaller perspective. I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. My time in Occupy was full of the name of our enemy, the 1%. The 1% were our rival. And I didn't question that too much. It seems very convincing. Yes, the 1% are doing a lot of bad in this world. But it wasn't the 1% we're after. It was ego. Because back then, I still hadn't developed this vision enough to see the truth. That was my perspective back then. The 1% are bad. Let's beat them. But what does that do? That only activates the ego of the 1%, and you have a clash. And you'll probably lose that clash. They have a lot of power and control over politics, over the police, and that's where things went wrong. Here's how I look at it today. I understand the 1%. I really do. I think they, just like the rest of us, need to learn to manage their ego, and the world would be a massively better place if the 1% had glowing, shining examples of egotistical discipline. But I understand them. Here's why. When you walk by a homeless person, do you give them money? Well, you might once in a while, but do you always give them money? Would you give them $100? Do you ever give them $200? No? Why? Oh, because they'll buy booze, they deserve to be there, that's their own life. That's none of my business, they're a lower class. Aha! Aha! That's exactly how the 1% feel about you. Again, yes, that comes from ego, and it's infuriating, how dare you think this about me? But you think that about the poor, the real poor. You think that about third world nations. You allow governments to go and kill those people. Because somehow they're not the same as you. They're not your people. You see? The 1% are their own people. And we are a lower class in their view. We are a completely different group of humanity that has nothing to do with them. And why should they help us? Why should they help us? That is exactly how a poor person feels about you. When you walk by and don't give them money, you're the one percent. Hmm. So you see how ego is the real problem here across the board. On every level of human society, ego causes suffering. 
It causes misunderstanding. It causes factions to form. It causes disbalance in the system. If a one percenter wants to defeat Ego, all they have to do is start giving money to the lower classes. Start helping the lower classes. They'll find a lot of happiness. It's also a sense of freedom. You get a sense of air out of releasing your ego. It's like green fields and open sky. You just, ah, oh, you can finally breathe. That, that restrictive, choking feeling that I had is gone. And it leads to just joy. More joy in your life. In every little thing of everyday life, just you're able to have moments of joy. Now, I'm not in any way claiming that I've defeated ego. As I said, you can't defeat it. And I'm far from mastering my ego. I mean, there's so many little quirks and things I do that still make me realize, oh boy, this thing still got me wrapped around its little finger. Especially around family. Family has a way to just drag your ego out with force. I mean, there's such a long history of fights and disagreements and, and, and ugliness uh, when you know someone for so long and they've seen you develop through so many rough times and times where you were a worse person and they hold on to that and it's, it's such a big bundle of ego around family that sometimes I feel that cutting out your family might be the best way to uh, gain ground on ego. But that's a big challenge, so it's good to face it. It's good to try and manage your ego around your family. That is probably the biggest challenge you'll face. And I mean, there's little things I do. For instance, uh, I'm balding, I wear a hat. And that's ego. I only wear a hat because I'm concerned what people will think about me. I always wear a hat. I don't want to always wear a hat, but I do, because I'm concerned. Ego. I still tend to overjudge my own voice when I edit this podcast. There's a lot of episodes I've scrapped completely because I just couldn't get it right. I want to impress. That's ego. Instead of just being myself, saying it, putting it out as it is, and not caring what anyone thinks. That would probably give me a lot more content, and you probably wouldn't even know the difference. So it's a work in progress. I've won back a ton of ground, and life gets better, more beautiful, happier, with every inch. It is really, truly amazing, the things that start happening in your life, when you start living with less ego, with a managed ego. For example, um, my old workplace, I made nothing but enemies there, practically. People were hating me who didn't even know me. I was making enemies left and right, and I didn't realize why. But the thing is, that industry is highly competitive, and I was getting into the competition. I was vying for position in projects. I was getting accomplishments and, and promotions that other people worked hard for and never got, and they would have an egotistical reaction towards me and become my enemy, and I didn't even know who they were. I mean, ego was rampant all over the place in that workplace, and as a result, I was miserable. But years later, in a new workplace, I've had a completely different approach. I've had an approach of building up everyone around me, hearing out people's dreams and wishes and, and hopes and, and interests, and building them up. Yeah, you go for that. You do it. I think you're amazing. And what's happened as a result? Have I lost any opportunities? Have I had people overshoot me and step on my neck? No. As a result, I've made amazing friends. See, I've been away from work now for about a week and a half, and one of my friends at work told me the most amazing and touching thing. He said, first of all, that he and another friend of mine that I made are now becoming friends themselves. Through me, they met, and now they are getting very close. And when I told him, well, sorry, I'm missing all those awesome conversations, he said, well, see, that's just the thing. It feels like you're still there when we're talking. That's how profound the impact is when you live openly without your ego getting in your way, when you just shine for what you are and radiate goodness and happiness and positivity. Now, what would it have gotten me if I was walking around that place, egotistical, trying to step on other people's backs, trying to prove myself against others, trying to keep others down because it threatens me? People would have forgotten me like that. They would have been happy to forget me. They would have thought, thank God that guy's gone. One less person competing. So what I'm telling you is the idea of competing, the idea of stepping on each other's necks, it doesn't really help you. It feels like it might help you, and if you don't, you'll lose. But I stopped, and I won. I won big. 
and I'm going to continue going this way because to me this is the only way to be. When I was at Occupy and I painted my face to hide my identity and take on a blank identity, that was the first time that I really realized the difference there between egotistical behavior and selfless behavior. Most people, and especially groups, were there pretty much for their own voice. They were there to be heard, for their issue to be heard, for their issue to be solved, for their perspective to be law. Everyone was there stubbornly to have their way. As a result, while people had discussions, while people had great debates and arguments, I saw that none of them changed at all. None of them moved positions. None of them listens truly to the other side, and nothing got done among them. It was like having bubbles of different groups and cults and, and, and denominations on the camp. There was no mixing, there was no harmony, there was no work getting accomplished, and that's part of why our camp collapsed. And here I was, floating between all this, without an identity, without an ego to, to, to spout on about. And I was there only to help. If there was a piece of trash on the floor, it was my job to pick it up. If there was a homeless lady trying to look like she needs help and everyone ignoring her, I would walk up to her and see what's going on. And often it was a simple situation of uh, a local citizen concerned about the squirrels in the trees not getting fed. The squirrels that she fed every day now were hiding up in the tree and she was concerned that they may be unhappy. And so, of course, approaching this person, I was able to handle the situation and make a, a compromise of, well, we'll leave some leftover fruit below each tree for the squirrels. And she was happy and she walked away. But as people were ignoring this lady, she was going to walk off the camp with a negative opinion, which would have basically put one more person on the side of those trying to shut us down. There was ego run amuck on that camp, just like there's ego run amuck everywhere. And I hope I've been convincing you to at least start paying attention to your own. Start watching your actions, watching your opinions, watching your reactions, and analyzing each one as who is this really helping? Is this doing good? Is this for me? Is this for my own pleasure? Is this for my own satisfaction and ego? Or is this something good to be doing? Is this a right perspective? Is this a right opinion? Is this a valid thought? You've got to keep on your toes if you're going to take on this battle. But when you learn to see ego at work in yourself, you'll start seeing it in others too, and you'll recognize it. So it's important to also watch others for it. Don't call them on it, because that's going to start a fight. But it's good to just watch and see it happen. And then you'll start realizing that every single major problem in the world today comes from ego run amok in individuals. And then individuals get together into companies, into governments, into corporations, into, into action groups, into religious groups, and their egos combine in that institution, and that institution becomes a huge ego run amok. And that's what's happening today. Destruction of the environment. That is nothing short of ego. Humanity trying to dominate nature, that is a fight you will never win. You will only destroy yourself and hurt others taking that battle on. But we do. We keep going with it because it's ego. And what's more, ego says, ah, we'll find a technology that'll save us. Don't worry about it. Our technology is amazing. We are amazing human beings. We could keep crapping all over this planet. But we're going to be fine because we are amazing. And we will win. That's ego. A tame ego will realize, holy crap, nature can destroy me. And also, nature is me. Nature feeds me. Nature takes care of me. Why the hell am I trying to dominate it? Why the hell am I trying to destroy it and win over it and rise above it? It is not an enemy. It created you. You are nature. So to fight nature is just to fight yourself. To destroy nature is just to destroy yourself. But ego has us completely acting without logic. I hope you're starting to see why I think ego is one of the most important things I can be talking about on this podcast. Because as we move forward as a society, things just keep getting worse. Ego just keeps gaining more and more ground in huge institutions, in individuals, 
and 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 it's just walling everyone up away from reality, away from logic, away from reason. Everything is going crazy in the world. I'm sure people are agreeing, but the source is not necessarily greed. It's not necessarily big powers. It is ego at work in all of these situations. So if you want to change the world, you have to start inside yourself. If you defeat it in yourself, the world becomes a better place, and one less wild dog is there for the horde. You rise above the fray, and you have a sense of peace, and you can affect change around you in a much more productive way than if you go around trying to beat change into submission, into action, into your will. I've lived both ways, and I'm telling you now that living selflessly, living in service of the greater good, and managing your wild, disgusting ego is the way to go if you want to affect change. I wish I had a clearer idea about this at Occupy. I would have talked to everyone there about it, and we may have had a much stronger, peaceful, joyful camp as a result. But these things take time to realize, for me anyway, and uh, I'm glad I was able to share it with you. As I said, ego builds walls. Ego is a fortress. Take down your walls. Start peace inside yourself. And from all around you, fortresses will fall. And peace will grow. As Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And I think this is what he was talking about. So, I think I'll leave it at that for now. I'm sure I'll revisit Ego later on, and it'll become a frequent topic among other episodes. But for now, I'll leave it at that. And that wraps up Season 1 of the Higher Ideas Podcast. Thank you, everyone, who's been listening to this. Uh, the listenership has been growing steadily, and, and I don't even know how. I'm just grateful it's happening. And now, as I said, moving forward into Season 2, I'm going to start saying things that are a lot more threatening to egos. So if you want to work on this, on yourself, keep an eye out for it. Keep an eye out for the line I will reach at which you say, whoa now, I suddenly don't like you so much anymore. It will happen. And see that as a challenge, to keep listening, keep considering. I'm not trying to tell anyone I'm right about anything. I'm not trying to dominate anyone, I'm not trying to surpass anyone, and I'm not trying to bring anyone down. The only thing I'm concerned about in this entire podcast is expressing thoughts. And that's all I'm doing. Once again, thank you for listening to Season 1. Season 2 is coming around pretty quick, and it's going to be great. So until next time, keep thinking. <laughs>